OK, so I'm going to talk to you fairly briefly, because we've only got 15, 20 minutes, about the whole subject of machinery and equipment reliability and how you put in place a reliability excellence program that's going to improve the performance and the sustainability of your manufacturing processes. OK, so what I'm going to cover is, first of all, I'm going to talk about the characteristics of the reactive environment. That's what you tend to see whenever you're in a, a, a very reactive um, manufacturing environment and the characteristics. Then what I've called my generic failure indicators, which over the last 20, 25 years of working in this game, I've seen so many times when these things indicate the fact that the organisation is probably going to fail in its, uh, in its programme. Then we'll talk about the journey, how you plot the journey, and I call it the journey from where we are now to world-class reliability excellence. We'll talk about the typical work streams and what you would expect to be working on over that, those years throughout that journey in order to achieve reliability excellence. And finally, the key success factors. So I'll have to go through these fairly quickly as we're a bit limited to time. Um, afterwards, if, if anyone has any particular questions, I'll leave my um, company details at the end there. You can always contact me, send me an email or phone me. OK, so let's talk about a typical reactive environment, what I call a reactive maintenance or a reactive manufacturing environment. What do we see? Well, we see breakdowns happen regularly, uh, and what's worse is that they happen without warning. As a result of that, manufacturing operations are not consistent, and they're also not predictable. There's also, because of that, pressures which leads to much more of a blame culture, where people are pointing the finger at each other. The production meeting on, in the morning can be a bit of a hairy affair sometimes, when production and maintenance are blaming each other. The also, what we tend to find in that environment is that maintenance guys spend most of their time working on unplanned work. And also, I always find, whenever I talk to people within a reactive environment, they'll say there's two things that they haven't got enough of. They haven't got enough people, enough maintenance guys to do the jobs, and they haven't got a big enough budget. And that always happens. And because of all these things, there's a lot of pressure on the management team, and those pressures show. And unfortunately, there's also no time for CI. And in some cases, no time to do the plan maintenance work. What you find yourselves in, if you're not careful, and most of us have seen this to a certain extent, I certainly have, is you get into Roy's vicious circle of reactive maintenance. And that vicious circle starts off by saying the wrong belief is that things always break, they always wear, and they always will do. So as a result of that, the backlog of the work that we're trying to do grows, and we don't do the plan maintenance work. Uh, because we don't do the plan maintenance work, more failures occur. Because more failures occur, we're using the resources for, uh, for doing breakdown work. That's where all our resources go. It's all about getting the line going making temporary repairs sometimes, sticking plaster on the job. Then operations try to cope with the backlog. Because the machinery has been down, they're trying to cope. So as a result of that, they won't let maintenance have the machinery to do their planned work. And because of that, we get more repeat failures. And we get people working longer hours to try and make up for all the problems. There's a lot of pressure on maintenance to keep the machinery going. The maintenance budget grows, in fact it goes out of control. Whatever we've budgeted to do, we just can't achieve it. Morale declines, both of production guys and engineering guys, and the standards drop. 
and so on and so forth, we get stuck in that vicious circle. And it's very difficult to get out of that vicious circle. So let's not underestimate that. Here's some of the, um, what I call my generic failure indicators. So over the years, I've been to companies and said, OK, you want to start a reliability excellence program or a maintenance excellence program or a world-class program, whatever you want to call it, let's, uh, let's talk about it. And these are some of the indications I get. Like the senior leadership team, you know, they're much too busy to talk to you. They can't make time for you to present to them. It's just an engineering driven initiative. It's just us, you know, it's the engineering manager or the maintenance manager that's driving the whole thing. Or, quite often, group have said we must do this. You know? And, and group have said that we want to collect lots of metrics and they're going to come and audit us. We don't really want to do it, but groups say we have to do it. <laughs> our PM compliance, it's 100%. Yes, we're really good at doing our planned maintenance work, but however, most, most of our maintenance guy's time is spent on unplanned work. Uh, duh. Yeah? The engineering manager, this is another good one, has a really nice, well-documented strategy. Trouble is, no one else knows about it, and no one has certainly bought into it. Or worst of all, the arrogance. We know all there is to do about maintenance best practice. We don't need any smart aleck consultant telling us what to do. So these are some of the generic failure indicators that I see. And usually say to me when I go in and I talk to these guys, uh-oh, we've got a problem here. Trying to actually get this programme going. Let's talk about plotting the journey. Well, plotting the journey, the, the starting point is to kind of benchmark where we are. Not to be in denial. It's a bit like Alcoholics Anonymous, isn't it? You know, I'm a reactive maintenance site and I admit it. Yeah, because a lot of companies don't do that. They're in denial. This little diagram shows a benchmarking approach. My company, MCP, we've been um, carrying out AMIS audits for about 25, 26, 27 years now. It's a benchmarking tool. It's not the only benchmarking tool. But the principle is you need to benchmark where you are against your peers and your industry sector and against industry in general. You then want to use that benchmark to identify your strengths and weaknesses to help to develop a strategy. And we're on about plotting the journey, going from, in the very worst cases, where the site is in chaos and I've I've actually visited quite a few that are like that. They're not even good at reactive. Then the next is we're into reactive. Then we become a little bit more controlled. Then we become innovative. Then we become world class. That is the journey that I talk about. But that journey is a minimum, I would guess, of, of three years. More realistically, about five years. So you're not going to get from reactive to world class overnight. You know, I've... Uh, I've had people come to me in the past and say, my MD has said that we've got to become world class. Oh yes, super, but we've got to do it within the next three months. Uh, uh, no, you're not. Be realistic. But that's the journey we need to go through. This is a kind of categories. This is an example of, of what comes out of things like an AMIS benchmarking study, where you can see the areas that we're looking at. General maintenance level, organisation, the way we're organised, work planning and control, cost management, the productivity and the effectiveness of the maintenance that we do and, the, and our maintenance guys, the, the way we manage our spares and materials, how good are we at, ma at, at analysing failures and doing CI work, how good are we at training and, and developing our people, how good are we at safety related to maintenance. And then benchmarking against the, 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 in our case, the food or the drink sector 
and all industry as well. So we know where we're starting from. So in this case, you say, oh, oh, not very good, very, very reactive. But that's our starting point. We've understood it. The other uh, device that uh, quite a few clients like is the pyramid here, which is, says, yeah, this is reliability excellence pyramid. Each one of those building blocks need to be put in place in order to become a world-class site. So let's use that as a visual thing. And we turn them, they'd start off red, we haven't got them. We turn them into orange because we're work in progress and eventually as become, become world-class, they all become green. And that's a very good visual depiction of what we're trying to achieve. Typical work streams that we need to, to work at, which will come out of the benchmarking study, will be things like equipment technical strategy, what's that include? Things like equipment criticality, doing uh, detail for maker studies, root cause analysis, actually developing good, effective maintenance plans. So that if we say we got 100% PM compliance, we are actually doing good PMs. We're not complying with rubbish, we're complying with very good, effective plans. Operator asset care, where we're basically involving the, um, the production guys and including them in the whole programme. And they are making their contribution to the way that we maintain the business. Work planning and scheduling, making sure that we have the right kind of work recording, prioritisation, planning, scheduling, so that when we have got time slots to actually do maintenance work, we make the best of those time slots. We do it effectively. We use our resources and our time as effectively as possible. MRO optimization, stores, having the right spare parts in a well-equipped, well-managed stores, ordering the right parts, having the right quantities of them, reviewing them on a regular basis so that we've got the parts that we need when we need them. Cost management, knowing where the costs are. Zero-based budgeting so that we are building our budget up from the base. Not, oh, what did we spend last year? I tell you what, let's take 5% off it and we'll use that this year, which is what most of us do. A zero-based budget. Also understanding our costs. Most reactive sites I go into, they will tell you, and they will, they'll, they'll, I'll say, right, where are your costs? Oh, well, here's our budget. Yes, but where's your costs? Where are you spending that money? How are you spending that money? They don't know. The majority of cases, they don't know. They're spending excess of millions of pounds on their M&R budget, and they don't know where they spent it. And we look at the, typically the, cost pro, the, the work profile of the maintenance guys, and you look at the pie chart, and you say, oh, we're doing that bit of PM, uh, that bit is reactive, and then there's another big block that says other. You know, what's other? Oh, well, we're just not booking it. We don't know what the guys are doing. And then when the accountant comes and says, you need to take 10% out of your workforce, how can you defend it? Or were they busy doing other? Yeah, it doesn't quite work out that way. So we need the, uh, the cost management. The CMMS, having good, effective CMMS in place and using it. You know, the number of times that we have computerised maintenance management systems in place and we use 10% of the cap capability of it, if that. Or we've got... What do we use your CMMS for? Oh, I've got wonderful Maximo here. What do you use it for? Well, just my PMs. And that's all we do. What about the reactive work? Oh, well, we record that on the spreadsheet. Yeah, one system that's used properly and effectively. So we get the right reports coming out of it. And last but no means least, the training. Training the guys, production guys, maintenance guys, also, other people within the organisation, part of training and development and education of people is so that they get it. They understand what this reliability excellence is all about. They don't just see it as a pain 
that engineering are trying to inflict upon them, they get it. And that's a very important part of it. So it's all those work streams, they, aren't, they don't have to be your work streams, but they need to be work streams like that. And each one of the work streams has got a, a plan against it. And we've got time scales. And we've got governance to make sure it's going to work. So what are the key success factors then? Let's go through some of the key success factors. You see some of these are the inverse of those, uh, of those generic failure factors I talked about at the start. So first of all, the programme objectives, the objectives of our reliability excellence programme, or whatever you want to call it, are clearly in line with the business objectives. So our overall business plan is there, and we can see our reliability excellence strategy and our objectives are de directly in line with that line of sight. We, the sponsorship just doesn't come from the maintenance manager. It just doesn't come from the engineering manager. It comes from the operations director. That's the guy that's sponsoring this whole thing. It isn't just engineering, it's operations. We've got support from the site leadership team. They are supporting it. They are on board with it every step of the way. It's not easy to get them to do that, but unless we do that, we're probably going to fail. Reliability excellence to do that has to be one of the key initiatives for the business. So when the general manager or the managing director gives his talk, about these are our main objectives for the coming year, these are our main themes, reliability excellence is up there with them. It's not just something extra that engineering do. It's driven by someone, probably the reliability lead for the site, whoever that person might be, they're driving it. They're not doing it all, but they're driving it. And we're educating people so they understand it, so that they get it. Not only engineering people, but production people, quality people, non-technical admin people. They need to understand why it's so important. They need to get it. Other key success factors, as I've mentioned already, benchmarking against the industry sector and the industry in general, so that we know where we are. And then as we go along the journey, we can redo that benchmarking to see how we're progressing. We use it as an indicator of our success. And that journey is measured and it's plotted against that benchmarking tool. And we've got a structured implementation program and we've got work streams. And we use those work streams to drive it along. And we've got people assigned not full-time roles, because normally we can't afford that. Sometimes we can, but usually we can't. But people who have roles associated with those work streams, they're driving them. And I would say this, wouldn't I, but external training and support, whereby someone is there available to say, this is best practice, this is how you sit compared with your peers within your industry sector, this is what good practice is, and this is how to achieve it. So that it can be helped along the way. So typically, these are the key success factors that, that I see that need to be put in place. It's not easy to break out of that vicious circle if you're in it. You have to do it a bit at a time. Remember, I always used to work for a guy who always used to say to me, Roy, remember that... You can't eat an elephant with one bite. Yeah? You have to eat it one mouthful at a time. So if you're, you're faced with a massive problem, you have a very, very reactive environment, we've got to take it piece at a time. And there are the work streams that you identify once you've done your benchmarking will help to identify which bites you take, first of all, and how you move along. But see it as a journey. And that journey is probably going to be five years-ish that we move along. OK, so that's me. That's a little bit about MCP. And if anyone wants to get um, in touch with me at all, we've got 
the website there, or you can uh, drop us an email. I'm R Davis at that, if you want to. Okay, so that's all. I've, I've think I've finished my allotted time. Is uh, if anyone wants to um, ask me any questions, then you can catch me afterwards. I doubt whether we've got time for, for questions now. Okay. Okay. Thank you for listening. <laughs>